We've now seen the algebraic formulation of the convolution sum. And I'll be the first to admit that sometimes the algebra can be a little uh, overwhelming. Um, it's nice to often think about things both geometrically and algebraically and linear algebraically in other ways too, because it sort of starts to build our intuition. And so let's look at that convolution sum a little bit carefully, because it's incredibly important that we understand this. We're gonna be seeing this throughout the rest of the semester. All right, so let me, let me reorient you and remind you where we are. Um, I've got my signal here, f of x. This is my discrete time signal, f of x. And I have my unit impulse response. So what was this again? I have a linear time invariant system. It obeys linearity and time invariance. I gave to that linear time invariant system t a single unit impulse as input, and it spat this out. Why? Don't care right now. It just spat out this value. Let's not worry about it. We'll talk about this later on with two negative values on either side of the origin and a positive value um, at the origin. And now what I know is that if I want to know what will the, how will the linear time invariant system um, transform this signal, I simply have to convolve with this signal. Uh, this, of course, is the convolution sum um, written out for a particular point um, on the signal. So let's go through that one more time in detail. So what am I going to do? I want to know what is g of uh, negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I just want to know what is the output at every point. And so I'm going to ask, what is the value of g at, say, negative 2? Just pick one of the values. Well, it's equal to the sum from k equals minus 3 to minus 1. All right, first of all, what happened to my infinite bounds? Um, I'd been writing this as an infinite sum. Well, I don't have to worry about the infinite sum anymore because this thing is only defined for three values. Yep. So all I have to worry about is h of negative 1, h of 0, and h of 1. And the only time um, h has those values is, as we'll see in a minute, when k is equal to negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. That is when it's centered at the negative 2 value. All right, so g of negative 2 is equal to the sum from minus 3 to minus 1 of f sub k, and k of course is the index on the sum here, times h of minus two, that's the point that we're trying to evaluate, uh, minus k. All right, let's write it out. So what are we going to get here? We're going to get f of, uh, let's start over here, f of minus three, um, that's the leftmost, times h of one. That's the rightmost. Interesting. Why is there an inversion there? And you can sort of see it in the colors over here as well. That's because of the minus sign in the convolution sum. It's flipping the impulse response. So f of minus 3 multiplies h of 1. f of minus 2 multiplies, by the way, that's what we're centering at, multiplies the center of the unit impulse response, h of 0. And f of minus 1 multiplies h of negative 1. I multiply those out, and I sum everything up, and I get the response at g of negative 2, okay? And I've color, of course, coded here everything. So the red hits the red, the blue hits the blue, and the yellow hits the yellow. There's that crossover again because of the negative sign in the convolution sum. Now, I want to know what is the value of g at the next sample. Let's go to the right. So g of negative 1 is I slide, g, I slide the, 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 the signal over by 1. And now my sum is minus 2 to 0 because I'm centered at negative 1. And it's the same game. Take f of minus 2 and multiply it by h of 1. Take f of minus 1 and multiply it by h of 0. Take f of 0 and multiply it by h, uh, h of negative 1. Sum everything up, and I get the value of uh, g of negative 1. Do it again. Slide it over. So now I'm evaluating g of 0. All right, what's g of 0? It's f of negative 1 times h of 1, f of 0 times h of 0, and f of 1 times h of negative 1, the color coding. So what am I doing here graphically? I'm taking this little unit impulse with three values, and I'm dropping it down on the signal, and I'm sliding it across the signal, computing products and sums. In, the, in linear algebraic terms, this is called an inner product, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, just doing the calculation over and over again, because that unit impulse fully characterizes the linear time invariant system. So putting aside the algebra, which you should be able to figure out, graphically what you should have in your head is that we take this unit impulse response and we slide it across the signal left to right, computing these products and sum, products and sum, product and sum, and then filling in the corresponding output value um, at the center of that unit response.
Now, just because I can never get enough of linear algebra, let me tell you that you can write that convolution sum in matrix vector form. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to take our signal, our input signal, um, F0, F1, F2, so there's the input signal right here, and we're going to create um, a convolution matrix, which I'll describe in a minute. And when I multiply that matrix uh, times that signal right here, I get my output G. And what I've done here, um, I've got my unit impulse response that has three values, same as before, H of negative one, H of zero, H of one. And I've put those, as you can see, in the rows of the matrix. I'm gonna skip the first row for a second. Let's go to the second row. So H1, H0, H negative one. By the way, notice that they're inverted. H of negative one is not here, it's over here. And the reason is because of that inversion again. Now the next row, I slide over the kernel or the filter or the unit impulse response, and I keep doing that over and over again. Well, why? Well, what's gonna be this matrix product? I take each row of this matrix and I multiply it by that vector. And as I slide that unit impulse response along the diagonal, what I'm doing is sliding that, that response and then multiplying, 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 and sum. So I'm essentially computing inner products between each of these rows and the corresponding um, input signal. Now notice one squirrely thing in the first row here. Notice how I brought in H of one over here. The edges of discrete time signals and discrete time images are incredibly annoying because at some point I've got it, I get the edge of the signal and I don't have anything that I can do over there. And you have to make decisions. You have to make a decision as to what you're gonna do. And there's a number of decisions that we, we can make. One is we can assume wrap around. One is we can mirror image the signal and assume that the thing behind uh, F of zero is the same as F of one. And there are these boundary handling issues that we're not gonna talk about in detail here, but you should know about exist in practice of what happens when you have a bounded length signal or image. You've gotta deal when you're dealing with convolution of what you do on the edges. And there are a number of tricks that you can do, none of which are right, but have just different sort of trade-offs in how you do them. Ah, let me mention one more thing here, because this is really important. This is a square matrix. How do I know it's a square matrix? My input signal has N samples in it, and my output signal has N samples in it. So this must be a square matrix. And if it's a square matrix, um, and I'm assuming that these unit responses, these, these impulse responses aren't all zero, then this matrix is invertible. And what that means is if I write G is equal to M times F, so the output G is equal to a matrix times F, well then I can tell you what the input was for a given output if of course I know the unit impulse response. This is the so-called deconvolution problem. And one place where this shows up is something we've already seen. Blurring from depth of focus, for example, um, can be represented as a convolution sum. And if you know by how much something is blurred, you can undo the blurring. The trick of course is if you know by how much it was blurred. But that process is actually invertible, which is not at all immediately obvious when you think about a blurry image. When you look at a blurry image, you think, sure, I've, I've obliterated everything. How can I possibly undo it? But what we just saw in that linear algebraic formulation of convolution sum um, is that you can invert it if you know by how much something was blurred. So very simple geometric interpretation of convolution. Take your unit impulse response, sometimes called a filter, sometimes called a kernel, and slide it across the signal, computing products and summation, product and summation, or in the terms of linear algebra, uh, inner products. Um, now what we need to do, of course, is go to 2D and beyond, and we'll do that when we come back.